Hello everybody and welcome to today's iceberg video. You know, those those memes that were super popular like a year ago and I'm I'm doing one now. Yeah, I'm so good at my job. But if you don't know how an iceberg video works, then we start at the top with the lighthearted or things that you might know, and then we work our way down into the dark depths of the lore and theories and things you might not have ever heard of, the bizarre and weird, as we explore the, the depths of Avatar The Last Airbender. And I am in the unique position, you might say, of being the originator of some of the things that you might find on these icebergs. Uh, having been doing this job, talking about this for years. This is my life. <laughs> And this video, by the way, was kindly sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula, a thing that I am a part of, which is really cool. I've got a whole series of videos called Beyond Writing, accompanying my writing series on here. And it's four episodes up already. You can go check them out by clicking the link in the description below. And for the record, by signing up, you get both CuriosityStream and Nebula together. So let's start right at the top. Kyoshi made the Dai Li. Yes, you know everyone's favorite Ba Sing Se secret police. Kyoshi looked at them and was like, you know what, that's a great idea. This is because the story of Ba Sing Se is basically just French history. It's a bunch of peasant revolts. And so one time the peasants were revolting, the Earth King demanded that Kyoshi put them down. And you know Kyoshi, she was like, no. And she single-handedly smashed the Earth King. But she made a compromise. She said, all right, you're gonna treat these people better, but I'm gonna create the Dai Li, who are gonna protect the cultural heritage of Ba Sing Se and create order in the city. And you know, she later said, ah, oh, well, yeah, if I knew what they were gonna become, I never would have done it. But she also said right from the start that they were gonna be silent, precise, and feared by all. I mean, she kind of knew what she was doing. And to be clear, she modeled the Dai Li on Jian Zhu's tactics, his subterfuge and networking, his strategies, and to be clear, Zhan Zhu is not like a hero in this book, he is a brutal, powerful man. <laughs> Next up, we have the classic mystery, what happened to Zuko's mother? Famously in the series, she vanished with virtually no explanation. And at the end of the series, it ends on a cliffhanger with him going to Ozai and saying, hey, where is my mother? Well, we get those answers in the comic book, The Search. And to be honest, I really like it very much. <laughs> Basically, she agrees to murder Fire Lord Azulon and forge a will that puts Ozai on the throne instead of Iroh. Right after that moment where Azulon's all like, Ah, you will know the pain of losing a firstborn son. And as part of it, she was banished. Now, her story is basically she was in love with this guy called Aikim when the Fire Lord turned up and said, Hey, I like that one. That one's mine now. And then she had to marry him and was forced to never see Aikim again. But then, when she got banished, she went back to him and they changed their faces with this actually really cool spirit called the mother of faces completely lost all of her memories all of her past and then became a new person called noriko zuko and azula went to go and find her and they were like oh hey this is our mom now i suppose and then we're going to leave her as is but then she got her memories back and decided to become ursa again i don't like this very much because i don't know i just wiping the memories I didn't really feel like the right answer to go for in my opinion but then we have the avatar equivalent of did you know Vigo Mortensen broke his toe when he kicked that helmet those screams are real because did you know that Momo was meant to be the reincarnated Gyatso but it never really made it into the series but you can see the design there he even led Aang to Gyatso's body there might have been some spiritual connection there Moving a little bit down, we have Zuko's hair evolution. This is a design animation quirk, and there's just thousands of these. I can make endless numbers of videos of little details like this that just give the show a little bit more depth. Basically, Zuko's hair reflects his character development, because at the start, his hair is tightly bound up in that Fire Nation symbolic haircut to reflect how he is totally wrapped up in the propaganda and ideology of the Fire Nation. But at the start of season two, he cuts it off to symbolize him cutting ties with the Fire Nation. He grows it out and he becomes loose. He becomes someone else. It's his character growth as he becomes someone else. But then he goes back to the Fire Nation and his hair returns to that, you know, being kept inside that, that, that clasp. But there are little, little straggly bits of hair around it to reflect that, yeah, maybe he's fitting in, but it's not all, not all perfect. Then after he faces his father, he puts down the clasp again. He leaves behind the Fire Nation as it is, and he grows out these 
beautiful, free, luscious locks that I could never have. He is freer than he has ever been before. And then at the end and throughout the comics, we see that he has a mixture between being loose and tied up. He's found a balance between his loyalty to the Fire Nation and of course, who he knows that he should be. Who does he want to be personally? That's kind of his whole arc. Then we have one of the great perplexing mysteries I've never been able to figure out. Why is Azula's fire blue? Uh, it's because it's hot. That's why. No, okay. Symbolically, uh, you could say that it's because of perfection. When she fire bends, you know, she is very, very precise. She'll send off single bolts. Uh, every single arc of fire will be very, very deliberate. Nothing's chaotic about her. And so you could say that, you know, like the blue flames is about her perfectionism. You know, not one hair out of place. It is a perfect flame and certainly not a way for the animes to distinguish between Zuko and Azula's fire. Mm. The Air Nomad survived. This one is pretty well known by now. Not all of them were wiped out in that single attack on the temples. I mean, after all, that'd be virtually impossible. And they're nomads. They're wandering throughout the world. The uh, comic Relics does confirm that the Fire Nation would send out death squads, basically, to lure Air Nomads into traps with relics and then trap and kill them. But of course this does raise some perplexing questions, like if some of them survived, did any of them survive long enough to have a child, and if so, where is their air bending, you know? Uh, well, there is some evidence to suggest that uh, being able to live in an air nomad community, to live the air nomad lifestyle, uh, raises the chance of you having air bending, and likewise it could decrease it. So if they're not raised in that environment, then potentially they just never develop that skill. It does also fit in with another theory, the idea that pretty much all of the airbenders that appeared after Harmonic Convergence in Korra, because uh, a bunch just suddenly appear after this big magical event, they might be the descendants of those air nomads who survived. Now, if you didn't know, there was an Avatar trading card game. I actually have a copy of it somewhere, and there were two Air Nomad characters in that. There was Afiko the Betrayer and Malu. Afiko was an airbender who betrayed the nomads and told the Fire Nation when and where to attack, uh, and he was also murdered too, eventually. Malu uh, survived and became kind of this lone spirit in the mountains, but to be clear, the trading card game is not canon. These things don't don't really matter. Sozin's weird firebending. It's a tiny little detail, only on screen for a few seconds, but in the episode The Avatar and the Fire Lord, you can see Sozin doing something that looks exactly like waterbending or airbending is animated in the series. He's doing something to this lava, right? In reality, what he's actually doing is uh, he is taking the heat out of the lava and turning it into like a cooler stone. This is a visual representation of that because we do see throughout the series that firebenders can put heat into or take heat out of things. Like Iroh uh, heats his tea without firebending. This is just a more extreme version of that. This is seemingly a high level firebending skill. In fact, it even has the exact same technique as lightning redirection. If you actually look at it, he's got the same posture, even down to the two fingers. He's taking the energy in through his stomach and passing it out the other side into the sky. And it tells us a bit more about how fire bending and its fundamentals is about kind of the management of energy, not just fire. And given this is heavily dependent on water bending techniques, it is entirely possible that it was lost as an ability across the Hundred Year War, as the Fire Nation came to believe in their own superiority and neglect knowledge coming from other nations. The Fire Nation equals Imperial Japan. All I'll say, is watch out for my next video. Original Toph. Now, Toph's character was originally meant to be a guy and more like the Boulder, or Toph's character in the Ember Island players, this hyper-masculine, big, muscly dude. This is before they came up with the idea of a blind girl, someone who is virtually the entire opposite of everything they were thinking and the best decision they possibly could have made. But that's the simple, the well-known, the easy, the light-hearted. Let's move down a layer. Sokka is White Lotus. At the end of the episode, Sokka's master. He is given a single 
purple pie show tile, a white lotus. This is the universal symbol for the White Lotus Society, a, a world-spanning organization of the most powerful, wisest, strongest people on the planet, all trying to ensure that things don't go to hell. The group wonders why he was given this, and supposedly it's just something to remember him by, but it could be an initiation into the order. And you've got to think about what this episode is about, right? It's about Sokka finding his place, recognizing his own value, his own skills, and considering he is all about coordinating other people, about planning, about thinking outside the box, Sokka is textbook White Lotus, and Piandao tells him, you know, you are worthy, more worthy than any other man I have ever trained. But Sokka's death has always been a mystery. We know he was deeply involved with creating this post-war world, and that is exactly what the White Lotus organization was doing as well. And being involved in the White Lotus would bring him up against any number of powerful enemies, one of whom could have killed him. Glass bending. I made a video ages ago about this, and I actually can't remember if I said I thought glass bending was possible or not, but it is. The books confirm it. The shards of glass in her skin plucked themselves out under the force of her earth bending and balled into a floating clump. It's actually not in the book, it's my phone. YouTubing 101, if they're reading from a book, they're filthy liars. But glass bending does come into kind of the difficulties in defining bending, and I made a video on this called uh, Is Flesh Bending Possible? Because for some reason people are goddamn obsessed with the idea that earthbenders should be able to like bend the iron in our blood or something. Makes me angry, go watch the video. Guru Patik is Lao Gi. This is a fascinating theory, okay? Now, Guru Patik is said to be around 150 years old when we meet him in Avatar. He tells Aang that he was a personal friend of Monk Yatso and a spiritual companion to the Air Nomads, but what does that really mean, right? Supposedly, he was born 50 years before the Air Nomad genocide, but he may well be a lot older than that. There is a man in the Kyoshi novels called Lao Gi. He appears like a quirky loner, often friendly, often lazy, but in truth, he's hinted to have gained the secret of immortality. Never hear the tragedy of Laoji the Wise. Being several thousand years old at the point in the story, he's described as having a wispy white beard, wearing ragged clothes that conceal corded muscle, with white hair, wiry arms, and bony fingers. Can you get an even more exact description of Guru Patik? I don't think so, but even more than that. But we will never know. I actually thought that I came up with this theory because I put this all together on my own, but then I looked it up and a bunch of other people had also thought of it. Oh well. Arpa understands human speech. Now, throughout the series, Arpa has a bunch of moments where he understands incredibly complicated instructions and responds in ways that a human would, as if he has a very real awareness of what people are talking about. <laughs> And this is Momo, my cat. How are you today, Momo? Wake me up, wake me up. So we have scenes written from Momo's perspective, don't we? And all we hear is just gibberish, right? Does not understand human speech. Arpa's scenes, though, perfectly clear. 100% English. But secondly, Sky Bison are literally magic, okay? They're just sky wizards. They can airbend. That is magic. There is a suggestion that they might be part spirit in some way. I mean, dragons are certainly more intelligent. They are also clearly more than animals. Why not Sky Bison? What are the chances that they are connected to the spirit world in a way other animals aren't too? I, I quite like that idea. When you look at the other original benders, the moon, the ocean, the dragons, the, even the lion turtles bestowing the elements themselves, they're so much more than animals. I love the idea that the sky bison and badger moles are intelligent, but intelligent in a different way to humanity. That beyond all of the floof and cuddles, they have a deep tie to the spiritual world, their own wisdom that we never quite truly see, that we can't even possibly comprehend just like the lion turtles. But it gets even weirder because of one little detail that's thrown away that barely anyone even thinks about. There is no bending in the spirit world. Why is that? There are huge spiritual dimensions to bending powers, like water bending and lightning redirection and air bending as a whole. 
Like literally just living in a spiritual community meant that every single child born into it was born an airbender. It's not a perfect correlation, like Ozai is of course one of the most powerful benders ever, but is very much not a spiritual person. But that relationship is there and bending ability is in a way an expression of someone's relationship with the spirit world. And if that's the case, where does that leave our sky bison? Especially given how important it is to airbending specifically. What 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 do you what do you think, Momo? What what do you do you, do you think? What do you think? Do you think anything? Gyatso is a murderer. Let's think about how we found his body. There are enough dead Fire Nation soldiers around him to re-carpet his entire house, okay? And let me remind you, when they attacked him. This was Comet superpowered firebenders. They are not normal firebenders. How did he kill them all? And how did he kill them all here, specifically in this area? You know, you could kind of understand him killing them one by one as he evades and escapes and whatever, but all right here at this moment? Well, the famous fan theory suggests that he basically sucked all of the air out of the room, vacuumed it all, and this does two things. Number one, it suffocates the firebenders, but number two, it kills their firebending. No matter how powerful it is, it's got no oxygen to burn. And this was considered pretty nothing until we see Zaheer do it in Legend of Korra. He creates a vacuum around the Earth Queen's head, sucks out the air, and she dies. Gyatso may have done that on a larger scale. I quite like this idea because it makes him more mythic, and I have to imagine that he killed all of these firebenders at once in this place, and I'm struggling to feel how he might have otherwise done that. Twin avatars. This is a fan theory that has been around for ages. Or not a fan theory, it's just a fan I idea, a fan thought. Uh, which is basically, hey, what if there there were there were twin avatars? You know, two of them. The, the avatar spirit got split, and they each had two elements. And uh, what an idea. Um, not gonna happen. The Aang's parent episode. Apparently, there was meant to be an episode about Aang's parents or that backstory, but I. I think this might be a myth. I couldn't find any confirmation from a real source saying this. I could only find other people talking about it. I did, however, find real confirmation from uh, one of the writers that there was meant to be an Iroh backstory, and we just never got it. But even then, an episode about Aang's parents would be really weird, because, like, Enomads don't have family units the way that we imagine them. Zuko says, you know, hey, you were raised by monks. Like, that is common knowledge, that the children in the Enomads get sent to the temples and are kind of raised by a community of other monks. I'm not even sure what the episode would kind of be about, you know, there's no gap in the series that kind of demands it. Like, Aang doesn't even really seem to think about it all that much. Original Airbenders. This has been an old argument in the fandom for years. Basically, in the original series, we were told that the original benders were the moon and the ocean in case of water, uh, the badger moles, the sky bison, the dragons. Great, cool. But then in Legend of Korra, we find out pretty concretely that the lion turtles, you know, they did, they did this. And then they gave people bending. And... People didn't really like this. I also have talked extensively about why I don't like these episodes. Go watch that. But there is technically a law answer, right? Uh, the lion turtles gave people the elements, but these creatures taught them bending. It's like giving someone a paintbrush versus uh, actually teaching them how to paint. Bending is an art. And Look, I don't like the answer, but it is the case. I've always so much more preferred the idea that, like, these people discovered bending by being super attuned to the world around them, you know, being spiritually involved in the earth or the, the air or the water or, 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 you know, the fire and the sun. Ah, oh well. Kyoshi lived for 230 years. This was a mistake. The creators didn't do the maths and she just ended up super old. There's a couple of them like this, but they just came up with an excuse. They said, oh, no, 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 we, we totally intended that. Uh, Kyoshi lived that long because of her uh, advanced chi fields. Yes, that. <laughs> Personally, I love this. I love that they didn't wreck on it. I love that it makes Kyoshi more mythic. I love that it fits in with how, you know, in some Eastern religions, mastery over your body even allows you to control your aging. It means you don't have to eat, you don't have to drink, right? And you can see this a little bit with Guru Patik as well. You know, he is super ancient, but incredibly healthy and has done that because he seems to have 
absolute control over his chi. And likewise, Kyoshi seems to extend her own life. But those are all on the surface. Those are all out in the open for people to see. Now we have to go down into the dark depths because most of the iceberg lives under the ocean. Let us discover its secrets. Dragons are from the spirit world. This is actually a theory of mine. They are magical and clearly in touch with the spiritual side of firebending. But here is the kicker. There is no sun spirit in the entirety of the Avatar mythos. We've got a spirit for the moon, for the ocean, for identity, but no sun spirit. Why is that? Especially when the sun warriors, the first firebending civilization whose entire, you know, city is built around framing the sunset, where is it? But I pose to you that they are the sun spirits, the race of dragons themselves. After all, if Twi and La, the moon and ocean, could cross over to the mortal world and become subject to mortal rules, then why not the sun as well? And on top of this, in Legend of Korra, we see in the communities of spirits, when they're all hanging out in this world, the dragons are amongst them. They are one of them. And this is to say nothing of how the Sun Warriors are based on the Aztecs and Mayans who have a Sun God at the center of their mythology, and guess what the Sun Warriors have at the center of theirs? Dragons. I put this theory so high because I think it's probably one of the best supported theories out there, uh, which, given I came up with it, sounds sounds like really arrogant, but... Uh, uh, Iroh is a war criminal. You might know Iroh as a calm, tea-loving, wise old man with no skeletons in his closet. You would be wrong. Iroh was a general, right? At the height of Fire Nation power. He himself was responsible for the siege of Ba Sing Se. But he was all in on the glorification of war and the Fire Nation right up until his son died. Now, being a general, laying siege does not make you a world criminal, but we do not know what else he did, and this is the same Fire Nation that systematically hunted down civilians in the Southern Water Tribe, something that Iroh, as the second ranking member of the Fire Nation royalty, would surely know or at least would have approved of, or not approved of that, would have approved of other things. And the Avatar role-playing rulebook, which came out this year, does also show us that the Fire Nation military as an institution was doing war crimes left, right, and center. I mean, Fire Nation soldiers were committing war crimes like children collect Halloween candy. It's always terrible, but they get a lot of them, right? We don't have any evidence yet, but I'm sure it is out there. But if we are talking about war criminals, that is a term we have made up for our world. But one class of them that we tend to prosecute at things like the Nuremberg trials and the Tokyo trials are crimes against peace. People who instigate or perpetuate war. Iroh would have fallen into that, even if he didn't start the war. Jian Zhu. Now, this is one of my favorite characters in the entirety of the Avatar mythos. Uh, he is a politicking, manipulating, brutal, powerful, incredibly intelligent, great character that appears in the Kyoshi novels. He was a friend of Avatar Kurok before Kurok died, and he got spiteful. He said, all right, fine, if the Avatar's not going to be around to handle all of the chaos in the world, then I'll do it myself. And he built up this network, which involved subterfuge and murder and assassination and controlling others. And as part of it, he aimed to control who trained the Avatar, to turn the Avatar into a pawn of his own. Own. And if you look at his story, he is arguably responsible for a lot of the way that the world has turned out. For the record, Janzu had thousands of surrendered prisoners of war dig a hole in the ground, saying that the ones who did it fastest will be dealt with mercifully, and then he buried them all alive. He's ruthless, but a fascinating and brilliant character. Next theory! UA should have been the Avatar. This is uh, not my favorite theory at all. 
Uh, it basically says that because Yue was meant to be the Avatar, but Aang froze himself and delayed his death, uh, Yue was born without kind of like an extra spirit, the Avatar spirit that she was meant to have. So the moon had to step in and fill the gap. I don't like this theory for a couple of reasons. One, I think it takes away some of the thematic resonance that we see in the Siege of the North, you know, when it's all about Yue giving her life and then her giving life back to the moon. It's about that intimate connection. Uh, but two, um, it makes no sense. It raises some really weird questions about like philosophical determinism in Avatar that the Avatar spirit knows who it's going to reincarnate into and has known it for thousands of years in advance. <laughs> And that that, in turn, means that person has to be born so a bunch of other things are already predetermined. But then again, there is, like, the concept of destiny. But then, for some reason, Aang freezing himself wasn't part of the plan. That that action was somehow completely out of the blue for the Avatar Spur. And they're like, well, oh, screw this, what the hell am I meant to do now? Not to say that Aang was, like, predetermined to die at that certain age. There are concepts of a fate and destiny written into the series, but I I don't think it works in this way. All right, let's just get all the UA theories out of the way. UA sent the meteor. In Sokka's Master, a meteor comes out of the sky and then he ends up turning that into Space Sword. My light went out, you'll all have to deal. Basically, this theory says that because, and follow me closely, because the moon is from space and the asteroid is from space, then that must mean that Yue saw that Sokka was feeling down and not Found really happy planet, with his place which in the group. Would mean that and he so realizes he to find Pian and then an asteroid and then down to he would get the meteor, which means the meteor. a space sword. That's the theory. Now, Yue does intervene sometimes. She calms a storm to save Aang once, but this is not it. <laughs> Sokka and Suki boned, and this one is canon, and I love it. In the episode of the Southern Raiders, Zuko walks into Sokka's tent, only to find him incredibly willing and ready to lay down the pipe for Suki. Then in the morning, Sokka is wearing this wreath, which in Hawaiian culture, I believe, symbolically represents that they have consummated. <laughs> Kaya equals Katara. Now, if you didn't know, Katara's original name was meant to be Kaya, but some other company had the rights to it, so they had to change it. You can actually uh, see that Katara is is named Kaya in the unaired uh, pilot episode. Uh, but then when Legend of Korra came out, they could use it. They had the rights to it now. And so they named Aang's uh, kid Kaya, the waterbender. And she is a lesbian. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Kaya the lesbian? It's a little bonus tidbit for you. Sokka died fighting the Red Lotus. We don't know how Sokka died, it's one of those mysteries. We know he was around 80, I mean he was old. And it was around the time either just before Korra was born or when she was very young. But something interesting happened when Korra was just an infant. The Red Lotus tried to kidnap her. And if Sokka is part of the White Lotus, then this could even be symbolically resonant. That the Red Lotus split off after the White Lotus emerges into the open, with Sokka leading it in part, and then, and after contending with the Splinter Group his entire life, he gives up his life in order to preserve its mission and protect. Is it a coincidence that these two things happened around exactly the same time? I don't know. It's a weird thing, though, to not mention when talking about the Red Lotus, that, you know, uh, he gave up his life defending you, at least not explicitly. It could have happened off the page. And there are important story beats in Avatar that have happened off page before. Need I remind you of how they clarified that some airbenders did in fact survive? Aang is a mon. When Legend of Korra was first airing, we had no idea who was behind that mask. And there was all sorts of speculation about who it might be. And so it was rife with speculation, but perhaps the most popular theory was that behind that mask was an old, grizzled Aang. This was fueled by a single image that popped up across the forums with little explanation, supposedly as a leak of future episodes of, of Amon removing his mask and revealing Aang's face. See, we knew by this point that Aang had supposedly died pretty young, but we didn't know how. It was a bit of a mystery. It was strange that it hadn't been communicated at all. And of course, Amon could remove bending, and the only other person who was ever known to be able to do that was Aang. 
The theory went on to suggest that after a long life of being the most powerful bender in the world, Aang came to realize that bending was a scourge on the world, and that he could remove it and save a lot of people suffering. Either that or Aang did die, but only part of the Avatar spirit moved on into Korra, and that was why she couldn't airbend, because the airbending part hadn't moved on yet and it was still Aang moving around, being Amon. And so Amon was a spirit of sorts, and to be honest, it's not the worst theory, especially with the knowledge that we had at the time. And credit where credit is due, that image, which of course did turn out to be a fake, was really well put together. It looked exactly like the animation style in the series. It would have been an interesting twist to play with, that potentially it ends with Aang dying and moving on, the last of the spirit moving into Korra and allowing her to airbend, but I think a lot of people would have been really frustrated with what that did to Aang's character. Toph and Sokka babies. We have no idea who Toph had kids with, and so this has been endless fertile ground for speculation and theorizing, and the number one name that rises to the top every time is Sokka. Supported by a few things. Number one, Toph has a crush on Sokka in the series. Number two, Sokka doesn't seemingly have any kids or concrete family of his own left behind, which means that there's a nice gap for them to fill with uh, Su Yin and Lin. But number three, and this is the most compelling reason in my opinion, uh, Zalfu, the, the metal bending city, represents kind of a combination between uh, Toph and Sokka pretty well, you know, metal bending and ingenuity and creativity and thinking outside the box. But there are also a couple of problems with this theory. Sokka probably died late enough that Su Yin would definitely remember her dad and for some reason never really brings it up in the entire series. It's also heavily implied that he wasn't around as a father for the girls when they were little. Toph does mention a man by the name of Kanto, which could be a Fire Nation, Earth Kingdom, or Water Tribe man, but she says that it doesn't really work out, and that name could easily be a cover for someone else she's trying to hide. And Toph having a crush on Sokka doesn't really mean that much when she also had a crush on Zuko, and that does not mean that she gave birth to Azumi. <laughs> Another candidate is possibly Satoru, a, uh, an inventor guy that only appears in the comics. He kind of hits it off a bit with Toph. But he also has wavy hair, which is very similar to Su Yin's. But my friends, let us delve even deeper to another layer of the iceberg with Zutara Works Better. To be honest, romantic chemistry is not one of Avatar's strong points. Some people say that Aang and Katara have the chemistry of noble gases. This ship has been around for ages ever since the series came out, and perhaps for some people it's because there's more narrative depth to it, but at least half of the attraction is the tall, dark, handsome, you know, man sweeping the girl up. It's a trope we've seen in a million stories. It's just beyond this door. What is? In my honor! Part of it is kind of this thematic symmetry of fire and water and blue and red, character opposites attract, and them both having traumatic pasts with the Fire Nation, with their mother, which they help each other get over. And Zutara was thrown around by the writers at some point in early development. But, I mean, Zuko is 16, Katara is 14, and they really did not have enough time with each other in the series, and in my opinion, I think that there is something very beautiful about deep friendships where people can change each other without it necessarily needing to be romantic. So while yeah, I can see that perhaps Aang and Katara choosing each other didn't have as much narrative or thematic meaning or depth as perhaps Zuko and Katara choosing one another might have meant. Uh, but I don't think that it would have been the right way to end the series. Energy bending was bad. This is another favorite little bit of commentary about the series that you see popping up from time to time, and it's not an unfair criticism. You can read about how basically the creators didn't have any idea how they were going to end the series, you know, with Aang defeating Ozai until the final season, even perhaps kind of the latter half of the final season, and they were like, oh crap, how are we gonna get out of this without him killing him? <laughs> 
They had written themselves into a corner, and this was one short way out of it. Because, to be honest, the Lion Turtles were not well foreshadowed. Them being shown in a couple of episodes is not the same thing as setting up energy bending as a concept, as a way to resolve the conflict of the series. Calling it Deus Ex Machina is not an unfair interpretation, especially because the finale is set up around this point of tension of is Aang going to choose himself and let Ozai live, or choose the world and kill him? And energy bending was an easy way out of that dilemma. In reality, I think of energy bending as a relatively poorly executed of something thematic they were trying to do. Because if you read Aang's arc and him in the, his role in the series as him continually telling everyone around him there is always another way. There, you don't have to choose violence. You don't have to choose killing. And everyone else seems to be like, no, at some point do you do, except for Aang. Aang is the only one in the entire series who keeps on insisting that, right? If you look at it on a thematic level, then that is Aang's ideology manifesting in a very real way, a way that only he would have ever seen because other people are just too blind to the idea that you can even find other ways out a lot of the time. Because alternatively, the thematic meaning is that Aang was wrong and the world is so much darker than we thought. And if you look at the story of Avatar as people repeatedly telling Aang that he has to let go of parts of himself, most iconically in the Avatar state, that is him literally losing control and becoming all powerful, but he rejects that power, he doesn't like that power. And then with Guru Patik, he chooses to keep a hold of Katara rather than become this automaton with no real earthly attachment. Then this is validation of that decision, that there is power in staying true to yourself, which is why the real climax in the fight against Ozai is actually when Aang is about to kill him in the Avatar state. He's got all the four elements and you and your forefathers have devastated the balance of this world and he doesn't. He steps out of the Avatar state. He, he chooses another way. This isn't Aang giving in, but him resisting the power that everyone tells him he should take up and use. And there's meant to be something incredible to that. That's what energy bending is kinda meant to mean, and I think that they just did not do that at all very well. To put it very simply, energy bending is meant to be a manifestation of Aang's spirit, his will, his conviction, his unbendable morality. And the tension is meant to be about whether he gives in to this draw of power that everyone else is telling him he should take. That Ozai even mocks him for not taking, even with all the power in the world, you are still weak. But, as I said, not very well executed. I don't think this was communicated at all, really. <laughs> Iroh is half dragon. This one, again, kind of originates with me, and it builds on that dragons are from the spirit world theory, because... I mean, it's been an age-old question. How did Iroh get into the spirit world? How did he see the spirits that other people could not in the real world? Well, my over-convoluted answer is that he might be half-dragon spirit. <laughs> After all, we're told that Iroh found and killed the last dragon, but he didn't. So what did he do instead? Did he just leave them? Or did, potentially, they give him a part of their spirit? And that's why he is able to transcend into the spirit world when he dies. Maybe either that or he was just super spiritually attuned, which is far, far more likely. <laughs> Tai Lee, Secret Airbender. This is perhaps the most popular and uh, common theory out there. And there's something to it. She has grey eyes, something associated only with airbenders, like Aang has. And eye genetics are a big thing in the Avatar world. They're a lot more uh, indicative, a lot more concrete, a lot less random than our world. They work quite a bit differently. And, of course, she moves a little bit like an airbender, which I suppose. Uh, but more importantly, um, in the Avatar role-playing rulebook, there's a bunch of new lore, and we find out that the Fire Nation noble houses got really in on Ear Nomad philosophy before the war began. So it's not inconceivable that some of them even had Ear Nomad children. In fact, Fire Lord Sozin's sister was really into Ear Nomad culture, so potentially there was some kind of secret 
air nomad sect within the fire nation noble houses and that got transliterated into tylee's and you know watered down version with her auras and spirituality that kind of sounds like pseudo air nomad philosophy is this one true well she's probably not an airbender but she might have some air nomad heritage way down the line i think it kind of takes away from ang being the last airbender if there's like this other one out there at the same time but it, it, it's possible gyatso is white lotus um this one is mostly just vibes you know you kind of look at gyatso and you go oh you know what he he kind of he kind of looks like he belongs in the white lotus and he he does play the white lotus tile on Pi show games with ang uh so uh maybe we do get some hints in the role-playing book that he was super interested in cooperation with other nations and stuff which i guess is white lotus territory but but no concrete confirmation it's it's all just vibes do you vibe it yourself do, do you feel do you feel the, the, the monkey yatso white lotus vibes iroh is half knowledge seeker so the knowledge seekers were uh the little wolves that help Wan shi tong in his library they they go across the world and they pick up scrolls and information and bring it back to he who knows ten thousand things and um i came up with this theory and that's why i can tell you that this theory is awful it makes no sense whatsoever there's no evidence to it that video i i, I wish i <laughs> never made it the the idea is that he's seen with a knowledge spirit in legend of korra and there's like maybe one fewer knowledge spirits uh at the library when we see it in legend of Korra again so maybe he he took it uh, i came up with it in a rush and it very much shows and i came up with a better version of it like two weeks later with him being half dragon the dragons being spirits so no don't believe this one katara's mum died because of harma you know the the creepy old woman puppeteer bloodbender yeah her so this theory has kind of two versions of it number one apparently harma escaped right and then she tipped off the firebenders that there was still a a a waterbender in the southern water tribe and that's why they went and searched for this one that's why he says you know we got a tip that there's one more out there in order to throw them off her trail and then they found katara's mum and they were like all right found her that's that's fine we've got harmer again and that is why Katara's mom died, because Harma was trying to throw them off her trail. And, I mean, this has a bunch of problems. Like, why why would the, why would the Fire Nation be like, man, we're looking for a 65, 70-year-old woman? Uh, oh, yes, you, you 30-year-old, you look like the right one. But the second version of it is perhaps more believable. Why did the Fire Nation start killing them rather than taking prisoners? And it may well be because they discovered they were too dangerous. Bathroom. Because she's been searching for him the whole time. It's quite incredible. This one is, of course, absolutely canon. There's no doubt to it. I, I don't think I've actually ever seen a theory with more evidence than this. Ko killed the blue spirit. Ko the Face Stealer is a fan favorite. Probably the most fascinating spirit we have had in the entire series. And he only appears once. And he promises, we will meet again, Avatar. And then we never see him. I was so pumped. And we never did. I that is the that is the biggest letdown of the series but there is a small moment where he is flashing through the faces that he has stolen and we see this blue uh mask type one with with, with white fangs and red eyes and it looks very very similar to the blue spirit mask that zuko uses in uh, in his disguise but here's the kicker. The blue mask comes from this play called Love Amongst the Dragons. And in that play, there is a dark water spirit who has this mask, all right? Now, there's a possibility that this story is like an old myth. You know, it's an old story that's been transliterated into a play. And so this dark water spirit may have been a thing until Ko stole its face. And we do see that Ko is perfectly capable of stealing spirit faces as much as human faces. I really like this one just because I love Ko as a character and anything that I get on him is just awesome. The Avatar fixes mistakes. 
Uh, this is basically the idea that each incarnation of the Avatar fixes the mistakes of the previous one. And I quite like this idea, actually, uh, because, you know, fate and destiny are a thing in the Avatar world. And this is, like, loose enough and undefined enough that it kind of plays into it in just a little detail way, you know? But let's look at the evidence. Avatar Sato neglected other nations. He basically worked in the Fire Nation administration his entire life. Then Yang Chen, like, she was universal. She was loved by all of the world. But... She kind of arguably favored, you know, humans over spirits. But then Kurok, who came after her, well, he fought dark spirits. He tried to restore the spiritual balance of the world. Uh, but he was also kind of neglectful and lazy and maybe a little bit too carefree. Not as involved as he should have been. And then we get Kiyoshi, who was incredibly involved. Perhaps... A little too involved, you know, with the whole Dai Li thing. She was assertive and made controversial decisions, but Roku, who followed her, well, he was quite a bit more reserved. He was, you know, more careful in the decisions he made as an avatar, but he did also let the Hundred Year War happen. He failed to stop it. And then we have Aang. Aang, who, of course, ended the Hundred Year War. But, you know, he didn't manage to save the Air Nomads. And then we've got Korra, who brings them back, or at least was there when they came back. The evidence for this theory is kind of loose enough that you can believe what you want to. You know, if you want to think that this is the case, then you can point to all of that. And if you don't want to, you can poke a bunch of holes in it. But I like that it adds kind of a an arc to history in a way. I like that there is, there is a sense of some sort of design uh, behind all of this, uh, which I think feeds a little bit into the themes of the series. And if it is true, then this might mean that the next Avatar is all about restoring the connection with past lives or something like that. The Lion Turtles are gods. This is another one of mine, and it's probably one of my favorite theories that I've come up with. Uh, basically, we get this little moment in Beginnings, right, where Rava refers to the Lion Turtles as Ancient One. Like, the spirit of light and goodness and order herself refers to a lion turtle as older than her. But there are a couple of other hints. Number one, obviously the world turtle appears as the originator being in a ton of, uh, you know, different mythologies. The mythologies that Avatar heavily draws on. But two, uh, there is this little line when the lion turtle is talking to Aang and he says, in beginningless time, we did this, right? And those words are just vague enough that we can interpret them however we want. And I like to imagine it as them having come from an era when there was no time, that they exist outside of it. Turn gave birth to time, uh, symbolically in the Tree of Time, which we see in Legend of Korra. But what's really interesting about the Tree of Time is it is surrounded by this uh, yin-yang symbol, right? And the yin-yang symbol are what Rava and Vatu also represent. The light and the dark with a little bit of light in the dark and a little bit of dark in the light. And we do know that spirits come into being progressively. They weren't all there at the start. So we can go, we've got the lion turtles and then we had Rava and Vatu. And then we had, you know, the mother of faces and, and father glowworm and all these other really powerful spirits until eventually we got to the little ones that we see scattered throughout the place that represent trees and forests. But the lion turtles are at the top. And of course they exist exist both outside the material world and outside the spiritual world. Uh, the Shishu can't smell Aang when he's on it because he's literally not on the planet. Amon is spiritual. All right, so we never really got a concrete answer as to how Amon takes people's bending away, but it's basically this. You know water healing where, uh, you know, Katara does all the magic water and it glows and stuff like that? Well, what that is doing is it's helping the energy flow through the chi paths of the body. And water helps it do that. Uh, Amon is pretty much doing the reverse of that. He's using water healing to block people's chi paths and prevent them from bending. But water healing is a spiritual ability as well. And the more spiritual you are, the better you are at it. If that is the case, then Amon must also be very, very spiritual, very in tune with himself and the world, especially because I'm sure that doing the reverse 
it, it takes even more precision, even more power, given he seems to be the only one that can do it. Now, he tells his followers that he was given the power to take away bending by a spirit. And that's such a good story. I, I kind of wish that they went with that because there's, there's so much more mythology to it. But theoretically, it could still be true. Yeah, he is a waterbender, but this is a power that he was taught by a spirit. I mean, we saw that Zuko learns how to re-firebend, a new type of firebending from the dragons. Why not the same with this? I love the idea that Amon, even though we never really get to see it, is the spiritual powerhouse. But here's the thing about icebergs, right? Most of them are underwater, and that applies to the world at large as well. Most of it is ocean, and we should learn a bit more about that world, right? And that is our world. Which is why you should watch a documentary by David Attenborough, yeah, the man himself, called Deep Ocean. And it explores the ecological world of the deep ocean and everything in it, and its beauty and majesty and the amazing things that live under there. And you know that you need to watch a David Attenborough documentary. Everyone does. It's just a thing that you do, okay? And you can do that on Curiosity Stream, which you can get access to by clicking the link down below. But in addition to that, by the way, Curiosity Stream has supported this service called Nebula, a thing that us creators, a bunch of YouTubers got together and made so that we didn't have to be beholden to like Google ads and things like that. And it has all of our videos. And I actually have a whole other series on there called Beyond Writing, which builds on the writing stuff that I put on here and you get access to that as well. So go watch Deep Ocean, by David Attenborough on Curiosity Stream and get access to Nebula and that uh, Beyond Writing series. It's basically nothing for an entire catalog of amazing educational documentaries and all of Nebula, which has all of our stuff, amazing creators who you all know, including me. And by the way, I wouldn't promote this if it wasn't really cheap. You get all of this for $14.79 for the entire year. That's 26% off right now, only right now though. Click the link down in the description below. The dropped fourth season. Yes, despite the fact that the third season very much concludes the story, apparently there was meant to be a fourth season at one point. So Aaron Ahaz, who was one of the head writers of the show, is quoted to have said, yes, I always believed there would be a fourth season. There was a moment in time when we all thought we would do a fourth season of Avatar. Then along came M. Night. Though, to be clear, M. Night Shyamalan wanted us to do a fourth season, but Mike and Brian wanted to focus on the movie. You can interpret the hell out of that if you want. <laughs> and that lost fourth season may have been what we eventually got in the comics with the problem with dealing with Fire Nation colonies and the search for Zuko's mother. We don't know. Instead, uh, maybe, yeah, yeah, M. Night Shyamalan's film ended up being made, though that's definitely something. As you know, the tragedy of Shall the Bitch. Ang eats meat. Uh, yeah, so this is, in my opinion, probably just an animation mistake. There are a couple of little scenes in the series where we see Aang holding a, a plate and there is very clearly like meat on the bone on it. And we never see him eat it, I'm pretty sure, but it, it you could imply that maybe he has. <laughs> Ursa was abused. Avatar is rife with dark things that are just subtext or only hinted at but never fully shown and this is one of them. We're given this one image in the comic Smoke and Shadow where Ursa returns home to the Fire Nation Palace and she basically has a PTSD flashback. It's one of my favorite depictions of it I think I've ever seen. I encourage you to go watch my videos on Azula psychology and Zuko psychology where I discuss kind of their family dynamic in more depth. But we do see that he also explicitly threatens her with violence, and I can definitely imagine that attitude being uh, both sexual, emotional, physical, all of those things together. It is no doubt in my mind that, that Ursa is a traumatized person. But the comics do give Ursa a story where she eventually faces up to Ozai and she kind of reasserts her own agency in a story that is very reminiscent of a lot of uh, survivor stories. It's very, very good. I like that detail, but this is definitely something that you might have potentially missed. Uh, I, I think that about as terrible things you can imagine happened to her probably did. Varrock 
is Sokka's son. Now, you have to look at all of the compelling evidence that there is for this theory, and that's very easy to lay on the table. You'll be 100% convinced when I tell you what this evidence is, which is, of course, that <clears throat> Varric is a little bit like Sokka. That's it. That's basically the entire theory, that they're both inventors and funny and talk a little bit fast. <laughs> And again, it's that fertile soil of Sokka not having any family of his own. And so, you know what? Let's just slack a Sokka parental label on it. <laughs> I need a meme where, like, all of the characters from Korra are in a car and, like, a fan slapping a... You can fit so many Sokka sex scenes in this. <laughs> New avatars look like past incarnations lovers. And this theory has been around for a while now, and it's mostly just vibes. Like, uh, Kyoshi looks a little bit like a, a Kurok's wife. And uh, Aang looks a tad like Roku's wife. And Korra looks a little bit like Katara, I guess. Uh, connected to this is, though, another really funny theory, which is that the Avatar likes women because we've never had uh, an example of where, like, an Avatar ends up with a man. Though I'm pretty convinced that the people who have a real hard-on for this theory basically just have a strong brunette woman kink, and now they see two types of people in the world. Strong brunette women and everyone else. <laughs> Again, we descend deeper into the iceberg with Toph is a bad singer. This is one that I just saw in the comments of my post and I found it funny so I wanted to include it. Basically, canonically, we know that badger moles respond well to bad singing, all right? Bad music, all right? We know that is true. Toph has a great relationship with the badger moles. Henceforth, therefore, Toph is a bad singer. You know what? I'm on, I'm on board. I'm on board. What are you? Bending should have been more impressive. So, one of the things that people say about Legend of Korra is that they ruined bending somehow. Uh, and part of that is that they don't like that it's faster and, 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 and flashier and bigger and better and whatever. Uh, but here's the thing. That is how bending was meant to be. So... When the original series was made, the creators wanted it to be more like that, but they just didn't have the budget. Animation, particularly for water, just wasn't up to scratch. It just wasn't really capable of producing it in the way that we see it in Korra. That's why things in The Last Airbender are slower and smaller compared to Korra. And if they had their way, it would have been more like Korra. Miyuki is a war criminal. This is an old meme in the community that comes entirely from the fact that there is this one throwaway line uh, where the herbalist says to Miyuki, her cat, you know, the little fluffy cat in, in the episode, The Blue Spirit, uh, she says, did you get into trouble with the Fire Nation again? And people have come up with incredible stories about Miyuki's adventures. Except it gets even funnier when you look up the phrase, Miyuki is a war criminal, and Google gives you this answer. She is believed to have murdered dozens of infants along with several accomplices. Azula, fire priestess. So, in Legend of Korra, Korra comes to this island where she meets a bunch of fire sagey type people. And one of them is this fire priestess. And some people think that this might be Azula for two reasons. Number one, she's roughly as old as Azula would be at the time. And two... Uh, there were always plans, and potentially they may still happen, for Azula to have a redemption arc, and that she would become more spiritual and, and, and stuff like that. And given we have very little information about what happened to Azula later on in her life, it is rife for speculation. It's like Sokka's loins activities all over again. I don't think there's much to this one personally, and I don't think that this would be a particularly interesting answer to what happened to Azula Anyway, the darkest day in Fire Nation history. These words come up when Sokka is researching a day to attack the Fire Nation, and he chances across the solar eclipse, which is described as the darkest day in Fire Nation history. But why was it described this way? Sure, firebending stopped working, but words like those are usually used to describe horrific tragedies, massacres, and genocides that stay in the minds of people for generations. 
If you look up the darkest day in American history, you'll come across 9-11. If you look up the darkest day in Japanese history, you'll come across the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings. We know very little around what happened in this time, but it was during an era of intense civil war, dynasties falling like flies, left, right and centre, royal family members murdering each other in a storm of conspiracies. It is noted though that around this time, Fire Nation history and politics began to stabilise, suggesting that perhaps this first solar eclipse was used to cull enemies of the Fire Lord. A horrific tragedy so terrible it could be used to take power and settle these feuds for generations. How many died to make that possible? What dark packs with spirits were made? How many firebenders were murdered when those who were kept under their boot finally realized that they could overthrow them? The next one down is that animal guides die with their avatar. This basically comes from one scene in the original series where Avatar Roku's spirit guide Fang the dragon chooses to die with him in the volcanic eruption. Spirit guides are kind of these animals that uh, all avatars seem to end up with. Uh, uh, avatar 1 had a Karibo, uh, Aang had Appa, uh, Korra had Naga. Roku had Fang. It does seem like this isn't just like a random connection with an animal. It's deeply spiritual. It's profound in a way that other people that aren't the Avatar don't really get to have. The idea being that they are so deeply connected that they cannot live without each other. And I like this one. I think it adds a nice dimension to that relationship. But this does mean that at the end of it all, Aang and Appa went on to live together forever, just like Fang and Roku did. How exactly, tell me, did Boomy become king? You don't know? No, neither does anyone else. There is no indication in that flashback that Boomy was ever of royal blood, and Aang certainly doesn't recognize him as royalty at all. The fact is, when Aang knew him, he mustn't have been considered royalty. Now, there are any number of ways that monarchs can ascend to the throne. They can be elected, chosen by the people or nobles. But there's no evidence that this happens in Omashu, nor anywhere in the Earth Kingdom for that matter. And in the Kyoshi novels, we see that the king or queen of Omashu has absolute power with no oversight whatsoever. Perhaps they're chosen via some sort of earthbending contest. That's why they have the pit and the challenges that Boomy puts Aang through, and Boomy, of course, would be perfectly capable of winning that. But it's also heavily implied that some of the previous uh, monarchs were not benders at all. This leaves us with one other option. He took power by force. And of course, what is Boomy good at? What does he tell Aang? Wait. Wait for the right moment to strike. Perhaps that is exactly what he did. See, Omashu was on the front lines. It was likely it had been contending with the Fire Nation for decades throughout Bumi's life. Who knows what sort of politicking had gone on in the royal courts of Omashu. Perhaps they had been corrupted, perhaps they fled, but either way, Bumi stepped into the role. Overthrowing the royal family, taking the throne, wiping out any threats to his grip on power. Potentially because he wanted to protect Omashu, and he didn't think that the regime as it was was doing that. In the Kyoshi novels, we also know that Omashu was a home to a complex web of diplomats and schemers, and yet we see none of that in the series. What happened to them? Well, maybe Boomy happened. All these diplomats and schemers could be corrupted and bribed by the Fire Nation, and he got rid of them, safeguarding Omashu for decades to come. The Earth Kingdom takes a lot from the many dynasties of Chinese history, some of which did rise to power in rebellion, with new peasant people taking the throne by force and using that mandate from heaven to say that, well, the gods have chosen me. So yes, maybe Bumi wiped out the royal family of Omashu to take power, but perhaps he did it for a good reason. Moving down, Zuko's wife. Who was she? It could have been Mei, it could have been Suki, it could have been Sokka. Who knows? At this point, it might as well have been. But uh, he does have one daughter, Izumi. Izumi does seem to have the cold assertiveness of Mei, but... May and Zuko broke up in the comics. Maybe they got back together later in life, we just don't know. One detail we have is that Zuko retired in 167 AG, when he still seemed incredibly physically and mentally capable. Did his wife die? Did that change his life? We just don't really know. Omashu 
is a lion turtle. So in beginnings, we see that the earth lion turtle, one of them, rises out of the earth. That it is literally submerged under the ground until someone called it up. And we also know that lion turtles stay dormant for long periods of time. Uh, they just kind of sink under the ocean and become islands. They become part of the landscape and uh, they sleep. They, 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 they dream. There was also a city built on the top of that lion turtle's bank. So the question becomes, what if Omashu is that city? It's the remains of that city built up and up and up and up. And there is a lion turtle buried underneath it that has been dormant this entire time. Why hasn't Omashu spread out into the surrounding regions? It's clearly capable of it. It's a large enough city. It even has similar architecture to the one we see in Beginnings. And here is the kicker. The story of Omar and Shu is about the origin of earthbending. The idea that these two lovers, you know, on either side, uh, learned earthbending as a way of getting back to one another. And of course, it takes place in the location where Omashu is, right? It, 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 that's the region that earthbending supposedly started. And if the lion turtles were actually the ones that gave them earthbending, then why not? Why not earthbending originated here with that lion turtle? And Omashu isn't the only city in the Earth Kingdom that is seemingly built around a large rocky mound. Taku is another. It follows a similar sort of structure, but it's built into the side of a mountain. Perhaps it too is hiding a dormant lion turtle under the surface. After all, humans hunted the lion turtles to near extinction, and the few that remained went into hiding. It all connects now, but we must go deeper. We must learn the truth deeper into the iceberg, because hybrid animals were just possessed by spirits. This is one of my favorite theories, okay? Think about it, all right? Hear me out. We see that spirits can possess living things in beginnings, and when they do that, it changes their appearance. It gives them elements of that spirit's appearance. The human walks away with like parts of the AI spirit, kind of these lemur-like features and patterns on his face. So, is this how the hybrid animals first originated? Because there are some normal animals. We've got Bosco the bear, we have Miyuki the cat, we've got a few other insects, and I think a gecko or a bird at some point. But all of these hybrid animals dominate the planet. They're totally out there too. So, what if the spirits, you know, possessed animals and imparted some of their characteristics to them, creating a whole new race of them that perpetuated throughout the world? It's especially because if you actually look at the designs of a lot of spirits, you can see animal features in them. You can see lemurs, you can see turtles, you can see goat horns, you can see hooves, you can see all sorts of half animal like features that could create these hybrid animals. And this would explain why the humans remember the names of just the animals as they are and take the names for the hybrid animals from them because they were around at a time when there were just those animals before the spirits were sent to the spirit world. But of course, it's been too long that everyone has forgotten how they came to be in the first place. And to add to this, the creators actually have stated that the lotus spirit that we see in one episode of Korra may have once been a monkey. A monkey that fell through into the spirit world and took on the appearance of what it was eating. That being a turnip. Given back in the era of the lion turtles, animals could freely move through the portals. It was a lot easier for them to merge with the spirits or the spirit world. It's not impossible that this happened more often too. The Avatar world is Pluto. Okay, well, not Pluto Pluto, but the size of Pluto. Because the funny thing is, if you actually try to map out how big this world must be, it is tiny. If you account for, like, travel times and distances, they can make it, like, halfway across the world on ARPA in a few days flat. And so, hence, therefore, whenceforth, the planet must be tiny, which is 
I think, fair. There are a bunch of different calculations trying to figure out exactly how small some people use, you know, estimating up as speed or the speed of a Fire Nation warship or something like that. Uh, but the fact remains that the planet must be very small. Also, it is worth noting that we see in Korra that the entirety of the world as we know it, the world map, takes place virtually on one side of the planet, suggesting that perhaps there is a whole other continent on the other side that we have not seen. That would be very cool. Azula's Redemption Arc. Let me just read you this quote. I always intended for Azula to have a redemption arc longer and far more complicated than the Zuko's. She had not bottomed in the end of season three. She had further to go. At the deepest moment in her own abyss, she would have found Zuko. Despite it all, her brother would be there for her. Believing in her, sticking by her, doing his best to understand and help her hold her pain that she can no longer hold alone. Zuko, patient, forgiving, and unconditionally loving all the strengths that he gained from Uncle Iroh. That's how she would have gotten out and changed, with the faith and love of someone she had hurt, but who had stuck by her anyway, just as he had been saved by faith and love from someone he had hurt, but had stuck by him. So, th this is where that Azula Redemption arc kind of came from, and we, we see the beginnings of it in the comics there are little hints of that there's this moment where Zuko and her are sitting by a fire and she is sleeping and he's watching her and staying up to protect her and you know uh, Katara asks him why do you do this you know after all she's done why are you sticking by her why do you stand up for her and, and then he says she's my little sister you know she is family I'm gonna stick by her it's that Uncle Iroh uh being passed down to him and through him and I like that idea Though, I'm not sure we're ever going to see that redemption arc. The Unaired Pilot. So, the creators, of course, had to figure out a test episode to show Nickelodeon to be like, hey, we should make this show. And, wow, the Unaired, <laughs> the unaired Pilot is awful. I hate it so much. It's terrible. Uh, but you do get to see uh, that Zuko is more evil. You can see the Fire Nation costumes are more extremes, and they've got, like, horns and stuff. Uh, you see the Serpent from the Serpent's Pass, which uh, they reuse for the series. And um, there's the scaffolding fight, which is uh, we see again in Return to Omashu between Azula and Ty Lee and, and, and Mei and, and, and Team Avatar. Uh, there are little bits of the series and you can see where they came from in that unaired pilot episode. Aang is a murderer. I mean, this one is kind of undeniably true if you discount cartoon logic. I mean, when he turned into the uh, ocean spirit and then totally wiped out dozens of Fire Nation ships, like turned them over upside down, washed people into freezing Arctic water in full body armor, with knowing that they would probably drown. It is hard to believe that Aang has not murdered people. And there are tons of other little moments in the show where Aang does things that probably killed someone if he thought a little bit more about them, like when he eco-terrorists the fire nation factory and the painted lady was there really no one else in there causing a flood or whatever you know but again cartoon logic these people survive and sometimes uh, they actually go out of their way to show individuals who you think probably would have died actually did survive but if you really do pay attention he has probably killed quite a few people avatar form equals greatest moment or perhaps more most memorable moment is more accurate because there has to be a reason that they appear the way they do in the spirit world or when an avatar is calling on them. And it's not simply how they looked when they died, because Kyoshi appears really young, as does Avatar 1. It's got to be more than that, and I thought about this for a while. But, if you think about it, one of Kyoshi's most important moments was her defeat of Chin the Conqueror. So, potentially, she looks like she does at her greatest victory, her greatest moment or decision, most consequential decision she made, which was creating Kyoshi Island and killing Chin the Conqueror. Then we have Avatar Kurok, who looks like he does at the moment that he loses his wife, the event that dictates his entire life. Avatar 1, he looks like he does when he became the Avatar, the first Avatar, when he combined with Rava. Roku, on the other hand, looks like he does when he dies, but it's more important that he looks like he does when he fails to stop Sozin starting the war. It's his greatest failure. And then there's Aang. Aang is reflected as being mostly young, even though, again, he died a fair bit older. But the reason he appears like that, and this was my idea, is that 
It's the moment he has his children. It's the moment that he is no longer the last airbender, when Tenzin is born. The world of Avatar is a post-apocalyptic hellscape that all came about because of genetic engineering. This, this theory appears in every single fantasy world, doesn't it? That like everything is just super far in the future uh, after a bad nuclear disaster or something. Well, here's Avatar's version of that. The idea being that uh, there were nanites. And the nanites gave people the ability to bend the elements around them to go. The, the nanites went out into the world and picked things up for them and whatever. And they got too powerful. So there was a special project that created the avatar as a check on the power of all these benders. And uh, also there was genetic engineering, which is why there are hybrid animals. And uh, this is why humans also remember that there were once normal animals, and they use those terms because they know that there were once just bears, but now there's, you know, uh, platypus bears because they genetically engineered them ages ago. Uh, and who knows, you know, the, 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 the huge desert, the great desert uh, in the Earth Kingdom, maybe that's covered in ruins of some ancient civilization. We do have the library, after all, buried. I mean, this one is obviously not true, but some people find it a lot of fun to think about. <sighs> but now we descend once more, one last time into the deepest layer of the iceberg to find the unknown, the abominations, the horrors we all try to forget. Because if you didn't know, combustion benders are tortured into existence. Combustion benders have always been mysterious. How do they come to be? Are they born or are they created? Well, in reality, they're kind of like the tortured elite shock troops that you see in other stories. Firebenders, who are often kidnapped at birth and molded into the perfect weapons. They began with something called the Unanimity Project. A bunch of cities in the Earth Kingdom wanted to break free and become kind of a fifth nation of their own. And so they tried to create super weapons that could help them win a war. And that's how the Combustion Benders came to be. It involved submerging them underwater for long periods of time, breaking their minds, breaking their bodies. Almost everyone involved in the Unanimity Project died, except for three people who became the first Combustion Benders. Combustion Man is himself mutilated, he's missing an arm, he's missing a leg, and he's mute or he is conditioned not to talk. He takes orders like a machine, he doesn't question things at all. Likewise, Pali in Legend of Korra was captured and enslaved by a warlord, likely subjected and brutalized with similar treatments, submerged underwater and forced to hold their breath until eventually they either die or rise again something new. They are beaten and broken until they have no will of their own. Pali was freed by Zaheer, that's why she fell in love with him. He taught her the value of liberty and freedom, escaping before she became nothing more than a murderous automaton. On. But the ability is also strangely spiritual. The tattoo on their head is representative of the third eye, to see better and greater than all others. And it also reflects how the chi is projected out of their forehead to create the fire blast. Combustion benders are simultaneously conditioned as incredibly ruthless, obedient, and powerful weapons, while being spiritual powerhouses, without any of the wisdom or self-awareness that they otherwise might have. Given that spirituality is sometimes explored as letting go of earthly attachment, of things that bind us to this earth, of our own wants and desires and needs and emotions, potentially this is that taken to the extreme and the worst form of it possible. Combustion benders are stripped of any need and want and emotion and thought of their own until they are just these murderous spiritual automatons who have no real attachment to the world around them they are asked to destroy. The Cherry Pip Servant doesn't exist. There's a famous scene when Azula is having her mental breakdown, where she plucks a cherry from a bowl held by a servant and bites into it, only to find there's a pip. A pip she could have choked on. Very quickly, she unleashes her wrath on the servant, banishing her from the, the, the kingdom, from the Fire Nation. Only, was the servant ever really there? 
If you look at the other two servants in the scene, you could read their expressions as shock, looking to where Azula is speaking and seeing nothing. But more importantly, the servant herself is voiced by Azula's voice actress, suggesting that the servant is a voice inside Azula's head. And we already know that by this time, Azula is seeing people around her. She's seeing her mother in mirrors. Symbolically, this could also represent how Azula is her own worst enemy. She has isolated herself from her own friends. So when she bites into that cherry and feels that pip, that's her choking herself. The White Lotus murdered Aang. I know how this sounds, but hear me out. It's why it's further down the iceberg. There are a couple of strange lines where members of the White Lotus tell Korra that Avatar Aang tasked us with keeping you safe while you mastered the four elements. Only, was this really the case? We only have their word to verify it. Aang died shockingly young, the biological age of 66, when previous avatars had lived to hundreds of years old. Now, the creators have said that Aang being in the Avatar state for so long had drained his life force, but that doesn't really make sense. See, Avatars lived longer when they were spiritual, and Aang was arguably the most spiritual of them all. Kyoshi, of course, lasted for 230 years, and it's implied that many other Avatars lasted much longer. What if instead they killed him because someone else came onto the scene? None other than Amon. See, it was around this exact time when Aang died that the Equalists began to form. And didn't they too want to bring balance to the world, across the world, across all four nations, regarding no boundaries? Balance between benders and non-benders, but balance nonetheless. And doesn't that sound like the White Lotus's mission too? Surely this issue had occurred to the White Lotus too, and it seems to sort of fit in with their goals, even if it's a perversion of it. If Amon had secretly corrupted the White Lotus's goals from within, then they'd need to kill Aang to ensure he couldn't interfere while Amon built up his strength. The White Lotus is, of course, also made up of the strongest benders in the world, and Amon fits right in. This would also explain why Korra was kept secluded and far away from a public city for so long. The White Lotus couldn't have her getting in the way. And on top of this, when you actually watch the White Lotus members fighting Amon's Equalists in the series, it's like they barely do anything. They're easily defeated virtually every single time, almost as if they kind of want to be. Almost like they're in on Amon's plan and can't let the world know. And let's not forget, the Red Lotus split off from the White Lotus because they felt they had lost their way, their true purpose. Now, Zaheer tells us it's because they had come out into the open and just served as the glorified bodyguards of the Avatar. But what if it was more than that? What if they truly did lose their way and came to see bending as something evil, as something they could use to bring an end to the imbalance in the world, but something evil nonetheless? Blue People Avatar. Now, you might not know, but in 2009, there was a little-known film called Avatar that came out. It was a spectacularly strange adaptation of the series. It involved uh, people being put into bodies who, who couldn't really bend the elements so much, but they, they did use bows and arrows and swords, kind of like in the series. Uh, and I guess they had guns, which are a little bit like firebending, and uh, the world did have, you know, a huge, massive spiritual tree, kind of like an avatar as well. It's widely panned as, as, a, as a very bad adaptation of the series. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. In fact, you almost definitely haven't seen it. It's, it's, it's a very, very little known film. Uh, very, uh, it had almost no budget as well. Uh, no advertising. There was no real hype for it either. Um, yeah, and, but apparently they are trying to bring out a sequel to it. Tell me down below, have you guys seen the Blue People Avatar film? It's a very weird adaptation. The Eldritch Horrors of the Deep. 
One of the older spirits in the world is the mother of faces, an ancient spirit who has crafted every face and identity in the mortal and spiritual realms. She says, through me, separateness came into the world. Through me came identity. We see many faces floating behind her, including those of spirits. And it's from this that we understand a little bit about how spirits really work. That they represent ideas and concepts at their highest levels, the most ancient and powerful ones. The mother of faces may seem benevolent, but she crafts just as many horrific and terrible people as she does good and kind ones. She is an amoral being. She is in fact the mother of Ko the Face Stealer who steals the identities of others in a, a desperate bid to acquire his mother's affection and love. He brings her their faces. See, mother, I have brought you your creations. Do you not love me? Do you not love your son? But there are many spirits far darker and far older than her. One who has no face that was not crafted by her. Its name is Father Glowworm. A spirit who is simply a great luminescent eye the size of a wagon wheel trapped in a web of pulsating veins. It's capable of tunneling from the spirit realm to the mortal realm, and all it wants to do is feast on human blood. There are, of course, many stories of forests and lakes across the world through which people never return that supposedly cross into the spirit world. The forest of the Mother of Faces is one such place, and all of these suggest that Father Glowworm has dwelled in these traps for mortals, so he can feast on them when they fall through. The entire mortal world is riddled with these little holes. But Father Glowworm is simply an eye floating in the ether. And this is interesting because the Mother of Faces has every single feature of a normal mortal face except one, an eye. She has none at all. This suggests to some that they may be two halves of a whole, some ancient being divided into two at the beginning of creation. But Father Glowworm's story gets even darker because he is eventually merged with a mortal man named Yun. And after that happens, he is described in this way. A blinding, nauseating sense of wrongness poured out of his body. People had always been drawn to Yun, but he had changed. There was something essential missing from the otherworldly being in front of her. Something human. He had become a hollow scaffolding, a rotting corpse. People couldn't bear to be near him. There are spirits and creatures darker and stranger to the human mind than we can comprehend. Father Glowworm hints at creatures and spirits who are far older and stranger than him, who view humanity as inconveniences, things that can be played with and devoured, who they think little or nothing of. It's always been a puzzle as to how Wan Shi Tong sunk the library back into the spirit world. After all, getting there in the series was nigh impossible. Well. That's where Father Glowworm comes in. Perhaps he punctured a hole through the world as a place to lure people in. People like Professor Zay, who sure enough we see dead in Legend of Korra, except he died clearly while in the middle of reading. Suddenly, it seems, hardly expecting it, hardly of old age or the like or hunger. Perhaps Glowworm murdered him and drank his blood. If the Mother of Faces represents identity or separateness in the architecture of the universe, then what does Father Glowworm represent? Death? What do all these other creatures he alludes to manifest as? What do they represent and mean? Could we even comprehend them? And given that spirits cannot die, it suggests that Yun, merged with Father Glowworm, was destined to reincarnate over and over, flitting between the mortal world and the spiritual one. And much like the Avatar, who is merged with Rava, is destined to seek out balance between the worlds, maybe Yun is destined to seek out the flesh and blood of mortals to feed his spiritual half. Unable to satisfy that insatiable hunger for mortal flesh and blood, doomed to live that life of vengeance over and over and over till the end of time till he becomes nothing but vengeance and hunger, with no humanity to him at all. Royal inbreeding to monopolize firebending power. In the search, we're given this little line from Fire Lord Azulon. A pairing of the Avatar's Grand Order with our own son will yield a bloodline of great power, one that would ensure my family's rule for centuries after I am gone. 
It's well known that lightning bending was really only an ability held by the Fire Nation royal family, and they were in turn the most powerful firebenders in the world. It was the basis of their power, and virtually every single person in the Fire Nation lineage was a bender. How is this the case? The answer? Controlled breeding. Eugenics. Almost. The royal family is always looking for the right bloodlines to breed with, to ensure their fire-bending power is kept within the family. After all, there are a number of other clans in the Fire Nation that would potentially attempt to take their throne. In the books, Zhan Zhu even captures the only lightning bender in the entire world and hands him over to the royal family in order to interrogate how he lightning bent, and, and then, from that point on, that ability was virtually only expressed in the Fire Nation royal family. It's not unlike the Targaryens trying to keep the ability to ride and control dragons within the family, it is the source of their power, and they want to keep it with them. So perhaps it is not surprising that madness shows up in the Fire Nation bloodline a fair amount. They're so goddamn inbred that they're losing their genetic grip on the world. We also know that Ozai almost threw Zuko into the ocean as an infant when he suspected he wasn't a firebender. And sure, Ozai is a bad guy, but what if this is what the family does? That if there is a child with no bending abilities, they simply never let them reach adulthood? That a long line of dead infants keeps the Fire Nation royal family on the throne? And so we come to the bottom of the iceberg. And right there, at the bottom, is that Zuko is the prince that was promised. If you didn't know, there's this prophecy uh, that there is going to be someone called Azor Ahai who saves the world, right? And there are a bunch of different signs as to who this person might be. One of the first signs is that he will be heralded by a bleeding star falling from the sky. And what better way to explain that than the comet at the end of the series? Zuko becomes the hero that we know him as under that comet. And on top of that, when Zuko is struck by Azula's lightning, he is given a scar on his chest. And what shape does that take? A star. A red, bleeding star. He was also born amid salt and smoke. Smoke, of course, being firebending, perhaps the smoke of the comet. And he may have even been born or conceived at the, the Ember Island house that his parents had. Azor Ahai is also said to wield a sword called Lightbringer. Zuko, noticeably, is one of the only characters in the entire series to use swords which he often uses in combination with his firebending. They are light bringers, unlike any other sword in the series. It is also said that for Azor Ahai to come to be, there needs to be a sacrifice. And of course, Zuko sacrifices himself under the Bleeding Star when he takes that lightning bolt for Katara. He is the sacrifice, and in doing so, he becomes the hero that we know him as. But most damning of all, the last sign of the prince that was promised of Azor Ahai, of this hero that will save the world, is that he will, quote, wake dragons out of stone. And what does Zuko do in the Firebending Masters other than summon the dragons that have not been seen in ages out of the stone mountains and they give him a power? That is an incredible number of symbols that Zuko seems to fit. He is Azor Ahai, he is the Prince of the Promised, and if you're not in on the joke yet, uh, Azor Ahai the Prince of the Promised is a prophecy from uh, A Song of Ice and Fire from the Game of Thrones world. And it's a little bit of a meme uh, because it, so many people kind of fit it because the, the, the symbols are so vague and they can be applied in so many different ways that, that it can apply to anyone virtually. And I just wanted to have some fun and talk about how very clearly Zuko fits the Azor High signs actually better than many of the people in Game of Thrones itself, which is hilarious. But that brings us to the bottom of the iceberg. This was just a fun little video to throw together. I hope you guys enjoyed it. What did I miss? Because, I mean, I know that there are just a million little tidbits of information, you know, little lore bits that you could put on these things, or little fun facts about the series that 
I just couldn't include, not for time's sake. But what are your favorite little bits that I could have included? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank <laughs> you. 